we got new microphones for these cameras and uh, we're going to see if this works a little bit better in cutting out some of the the congregation noise during the during the sermon whenever we record it so we'll just try it y'all probably recognize this lesson here because i gave it in october but remember i said that we had lost all the lessons from that corrupted chip and this is one of them we lost i thought well since we ain't got a full house and stuff today to start the revelation study that we was going to do that i just redo this so that we'd have it uh recorded so with that in mind, well, let's uh, let's go into it. I don't have a scripture reading this morning, because like I said, whenever I first give it, there is no scripture in the Bible that states a law of exclusion, but it's all over the Bible. I want to read this morning a uh, a post or a letter from a Robert C. Vail, who is a pulpit preacher at the Central Church of Christ in Martinsburg, West Virginia, that I thought was real. Uh, interesting and explained this point real well. He said, in the Bible, we find generic as well as specific commands. Generic commands are, in gen are general in nature and do not specify in pa any particular method for obeying them. For example, the Great Commission features a general command to go into all the world, but it is not specific as to how to go. That is, the manner of going is not specified. We can find examples of various ways by which the early disciples went, including walking, going by boat, or even by letters. All of these methods were used in the first century, and so we conclude that the method of going is a matter of expediency in the generic command to go. Specific commands not only impose an obligation, but they specify a particular method or other component for discharging it. Thus, the component becomes a part of the command. And even if it were possible to do what God said in some other way, such would be a violation of the command, because the command includes the specified method. For example, the Great Commission features a specific command as to the content of what is to be preached, namely the gospel. The command to go into all the world and preach the gospel specifies that what is to be preached. Therefore, if we went into all the world and preached anything else, we would be in violation of the command. Going into all the world and preaching denominationalism, Americanism, capitalism, or 21st century culturalism is not obeying the Great Commission. This principle is sometimes stated as follows. When God specifies a particular method or type of activity, all other options are excluded. This is called God's law of exclusion. It is a common principle in given instructions which each of us understands and recognizes in daily life. For example, if a parent tells a child to go to a particular store and buy bread, going into any other store is unauthorized because a particular store has been specified in the instruction. All other options have been ruled out by the law of exclusion. With these thoughts in mind, let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. I think I actually read a little bit too far on that, guys. Uh, I didn't have a break in there, but uh, I think I read past what his comments were, and I sure don't want to say that he said it if he didn't say it. It ain't right. Uh but he did, he did uh, go all the way down to uh, where we talked about not obeying the Great Commission. That, that's where he stopped. Then my thought started in uh, where I said this principle is sometimes stated when God uh, specifies a particular method or type of activity, all other options are excluded. And this is what God, or what we call God's law of exclusion. It's a common principle in given instructions which each of us understands and recognizes in our daily life. And then I give the example of the, of the child going to the store to buy a loaf of bread. You know, and, and some could hey, say here that, you know, that's a little radical, isn't it, Brother Paul? I mean, if the kids went to a different store than the one specified, would it really make that big a difference? Just as long as the kid comes home with a loaf of bread, that's all that really matters, isn't it? Well, let's take this to a more personal nature. Let's, let's make it about you. 
let's say that you took your car in for an oil change and uh, told the guys there at the at the tire shop, said, hey, I, I need you to change the oil in my truck. And you went and sit in the lobby. And then you, whenever you went to uh, uh, get your truck, once they got done with it, they give you a bill for $1,400. Well, you, you might kind of freak out just a little bit, huh? Uh, you, you'd kind of question it, wouldn't you? Guys, I've never heard of an oil change costing that much. And they might tell you, well, you know, uh, while we was changing your oil, we noticed that your mileage was real high and it had been a long time since you got your transmission fluid changed. So we changed that in your filter. And then we noticed that your tires were really bald and snowstorms coming, so we changed those for you too. And you might say, well, you didn't have my authority to do it. Is that any different than the child getting a loaf of bread from a different store? He doesn't have the authority to do it. If you specified a specific store, the child shouldn't question your authority or, or undermine it or overrule it. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I fully understand God's logic for everything, but I am going to tell you I don't have to understand God's logic for everything. I just have to do what he says. I have to trust him. I don't have the authority to change it, what God tells me. Just like a child doesn't have the authority to go to a different store than the one you specified. Psalms 119, 102 through 104 says, I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Many people are going to ask you, is the law of exclusion a specifically stated law inside the Bible, either the Old Testament or New? And no, it's not specifically stated, thou shalt have a law of exclusion. But we know and understand that the Bible actually teaches us how to conduct ourselves in all things by three different methods, three different ways. And those three ways, ways are by command, by example, and by necessary inference. And we're going to give one example of all three of these ways real quick so that you understand them. And there's a lot more through the scriptures, but we're not going to put that much time into it this morning. A command. You could turn to John 13 and 34. Jesus says, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. So it's an unconditional love that Jesus is talking about here that we love each other with. And he makes it very clear up front that this is a commandment, that's something we're supposed to do. And then we have examples. An example can be found in Acts the 20th chapter in verse 7. It says, And upon the first day of the week when the disciples come together to break bread. We know by the example set down by, set down by the early church and the apostles that we're to follow that example of coming together every first day of the week or Sunday as we call it for the communion. That's our number one reason for coming. And then you have necessary inference. In 2 Peter 3, 10 and 11, it says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with the great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness? The law of exclusion is not a law. <clears throat> for general commands. The law of exclusion is for laws that specify how, when, or why laws are to be carried out. They had them in the Old Testament, and we have them in the New Testament. Let's look, take a look at several in each testament. Let's start with the old in the, in the garden, the very beginning, the Garden of Eden. You know, it's really ironic here that in the beginning of creation with the first man and woman, that God really lays out an explicit direction of what the law of exclusion is. Listen to what the Bible says in Genesis 2.16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. 
So here in the very beginning of time, God starts laying down laws for man to live by. And he begins by telling them, hey guys, I made a bunch of trees in this garden for free. And out of every one of them here in the garden, you can freely fill yourselves up, eat all you want. But then, in the next verse, he starts it with the word but. Now what this word but does is it makes an exclusion for the comment or command that he just gave to eat out of every tree. Genesis 2 and 17, but of the tree, but, 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 of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So now he excludes one tree out of this whole group, which he had just given them to freely eat of. And that was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He excludes it by saying, Thou shalt not freely eat a bite, because when you do, you're going to die. Have you ever noticed that on the laws of exclusion that God is usually protecting his people from something bad? Even if we don't understand it, he's still doing it for our benefit. We want to turn to 2 Kings, the 5th chapter. Read verses 1 through 14. And we're going we're gonna to kind of calm in as we go along here, okay? This is about Elisha and Naaman. It's a story. It's a good old Bible story. <clears throat> Second Kings 5, starting with verse 1, says, Now Naaman was captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He, he was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. So Naaman here was a great man, captain of the armies of Syria. He's very honorable in the sight of the Lord because the Lord had helped him give deliverance to the armies of Syria. But he was a leper. He had leprosy, a terrible, highly contagious disease in that time. In fact, the disease was so terrible that if you were a leper, you didn't get to live in the cities. They had colonies outside the cities for lepers, and they take, took them food. They wasn't allowed in the cities a lot of times because it was such a terrible disease. The next verse says, And the Syrians had gone out by companies and brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. So this little maid had been captured by the armies of the Syrians. <clears throat> she was an Israelite, and she was like one of the servants to, to Naaman's wife. Verse 3 and she said unto her mistress, mistress, Would God my Lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. So, so this little Israelite lady, uh, she told Naaman's wife that he, if he had just listened to the prophet in Samaria, that the Lord God could cure his, his leprosy. Verse 4, And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus, and the maid that is said, thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. And so somebody went and told Naaman and said, Hey, this maid that's taking care of your wife, this Israelite, said that her Lord, her God, can cure you of your leprosy. Man, don't you know that was like through chills through him to, to, to know that he could be cured of this horrible disease? And the king of Syria said, Go to. Go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. So the king of Syria here, being Naaman's friend, said, Look, go unto the king of Israel. I'll send a letter with you explaining the situation and take this money to, to help be friends and pay for being cured because I would like to have a, a Naaman cured. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. So Naaman took this letter to the king of Israel, and the letter explained to this king of Israel that Naaman had come so that their Lord God could cure him of his leprosy. <coughs> and, <it coughs> excuse me. and it came to pass when the king of Israel had read the letter that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God? 
to kill and to make alive that this man does sin unto, unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh the quarrel against me. So the king of Israel read the letter and goes, Oh my goodness, I'm not God. I can't kill or make someone alive or cure them of leprosy. I think this is just some tricky way to pick a fight with me. And, and, and it was so when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. So when Elisha heard, uh, and I, Elisha was a prophet, so whenever he had heard that the king had really got upset over this, and even tore his clothes, you know, rent his clothes, he, he told him, he said, hey, buddy, uh, don't worry about it. You just send him to me, and I'll show him that there truly is a prophet in Israel that can cure him. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha, and Elisha sent a messenger. <laughs> and <clears throat> wash in the Jordan seven times and thy flesh shall come again to thee and thou shalt be clean. <clears throat> so Naaman, he went and found Elisha's house and Elisha sent a messenger to him. Elisha didn't even go to meet him face to face and the messenger told him what Elisha said. Go, go tell, <clears throat> go wash in Jordan seven times and you'll be cured. Then the scriptures say, but Naaman was wroth. He was mad. I mean, he was hot. Okay, Naaman was wroth, and he went away and said, Behold, I thought surely he would come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. <laughs> you know, Naaman was upset. He was expecting Elijah to, to come out with some great big fancy robes on and call on the name of God and Wave a magic wand over him and poof, his leprosy be gone. Uh, didn't happen that way, did it? And then Naaman goes on to say, Are not Abana and Farfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And so now Naaman makes a huge, huge mistake. He starts comparing his wisdom against God's wisdom. He says, don't we have better water than they got in Israel? Why do I got to use Israel's water? Why do I got to go to Jordan? It's a nasty river. Ain't fit to wash in. And so he just goes away mad. And so his servants come near and spake unto him and said, my father, if the prophet had bid thee to do some great thing, Wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then, when he saith to thee, wash and be clean? So his servants go and talk some sense into to Naaman. And basically they tell him, said, look, if it had been like you thought and made some grand deal and made it wave a magic wand and you'd be cured, you'd have happily done anything he asked. Don't you think you ought to just try something really small, like going and washing in the river? And so I guess it kind of got to him because the next verse says, Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. You know, it's amazing what just obeying the will of God will do for a man, isn't it? Had he tried one of the rivers in his homeland instead of the river Jordan, it simply would not have worked. Had he only dipped himself six times, it simply would not have worked. You see, it wasn't the water in the river Jordan that killed Naaman. It wasn't the number of times that he dipped in this river that healed Naaman. It was him being obedient to the will of God that healed Naaman. We've got to exclude everything but his will. Let's take a look in Genesis 6, chapter, verses 11 through 16, and let's look at the ark for a minute. Mm. I'm still fighting this old crud some, guys. Just bear with me. Genesis 6, 11 through 16. 
says, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them from the, with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Room shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, and the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and a cubit shalt thou finish it above. And the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof, with lower, second, and third stories thou shalt make it. <coughs> According to Genesis, the ninth chapter, verses 28 and 29, Noah was 520 years old when he started building the ark. Now, a feller that old, Probably pretty smart, ain't he? Got a lot of wisdom tucked away. He's seen a lot, he's done a lot, he understands a lot. Let's say in all of Noah's great wisdom that he decided pine would be a much better wood than gopher wood. His slider floated better. Do you think that that would please God? No. Let's say in all of Noah's great wisdom that he didn't want to put multiple rooms in it. They only only wanted one great big open room. Do you think that would have pleased God? Let's say in all of Noah's great wisdom that he understood that the water would cause the wood to swell and it would settle it up better than any pitch he could ever put on it. And he just decided not to go to the trouble of putting the pitch on within and without like God said. Would that have pleased God? Let's say in all of Noah's great wisdom, he might have been a boat builder for a hundred years. We don't know. Probably not because there wasn't much water on the earth then, I don't believe. Let's say that he decided to make the ark 50 cubits longer or wider would make it more seaworthy, especially if it got rough. Would that have pleased God? Let's say in all of Noah's great wisdom that he thought, if I put a wind in this thing, that thing's going to leak water when the wind blows, you know, the rain and stuff, you know, on that side. Uh, it could sink the boat. We really don't need a window in it anyway or a door. Would that have pleased God? <clears throat> Let's say in all of Noah's great wisdom that he thought three stories would really make this thing too tall. It'd be top heavily, top heavy, and it'd probably capsize it. So let's just put two stories in it instead. Make it shorter. Make it more sea stable. Would that have pleased God? You see, Noah could have really changed this ark in a lot of ways. He could have done things a lot different than the way God told him to do it. But none of that would have pleased God. This is where the law of exclusion really came into play in Noah's life. God told him exactly how to build the ark, and he had no authority for changing the way that God said to do it. Therefore, everything else, every measurement, every idea was excluded from the way he was to build the ark. I want to take a, a look at... Uh, some uh, very old men now, maybe not as old as Noah. I want to look at the sons of Aaron, Nadab and Abihu. It's a story in the Old Testament. And according to our thinking today, this story ends very, very brutally. But in the end, it shows what disobedience to God's will will accomplish a man. Turn to Leviticus, the sixth chapter. We're going to start with verse 8 and we're going to read. <clears throat> through verse 18. All the people that uh, want to try to impose Old Testament law today, whether Sabbath worship or something like this, ought, ought to read stuff like this and see how it was back then. 
Leviticus, the sixth chapter, starting with verse 8. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Command, command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. It, it is the burnt offering because of the burning upon the altar all night unto the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be burning in it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment, and his linen breeches shall he put upon his flesh, and take the ashes which the fire hath consumed with the burnt offering on the altar, and he shall put them beside the altar. And he shall put off his garments and put on other garments and carry forth the ashes without the camp unto a clean place. And the fire upon the altar shall be burning in it, and it shall not be put out. And the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in order upon it. And he shall burn thereon the fat of the peace offerings. The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. And this is the law of the meat offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it before the Lord, before the altar. And he shall take of it his handful of the flour of the meat offering and the oil thereof and all the frankincense which is upon the meat offering and shall burn it upon the altar for sweet savor, even the memorial of it unto the Lord. And the remainder thereof shall Aaron and his sons eat with the unleavened bread shall it be eaten in the holy place in the court of the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall eat it. It shall not be bacon with leaven. I have given it unto them for their portion of my offerings made by fire. It is most holy, as is the sin offering and the trespass offering. All the males among the children of Aaron shall eat it. It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings of the Lord made by fire. Every one that toucheth them shall be holy. <clears throat> now, that's pretty complicated rituals, isn't it? That Aaron and his sons had to tend to. God made it very specific as to how they were supposed to do it throughout the entire ceremony, didn't he? Let's take a look at what happened when they didn't do it exactly like God said. Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. It says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them as censor and put fire thereon, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. See, they didn't think it was any great big deal. Let's add some lights and some smoke to this show. Let's throw in a piano and some drums, guys. We'll make this thing better than the way God said. But they offered something that God commanded them not to. The law of exclusion that God laid out that told them exactly how to do it forbid doing it any other way because God didn't authorize it. <clears throat> how about the New Testament? This is a question we've got to ask is does this law of exclusion that we know now is in the Old Testament, does it apply to us today in the New Testament? The answer, of course, is most definite yes. I want to start off explaining and showing you this by a problem that's recently started that's plaguing the church in a couple of different congregations by misunderstanding from some of our young people. Back about 15 years or so ago, I had a lady come to our house and pick up a longhorn squeeze shoot from us. As we was talking and conversing amongst ourselves, we got on the subject of religion. She explained to me that she went to church on Tuesday nights, that life was just so hectic on Sunday that a bunch of them had got together and figured out that Tuesday night would be just fine and that they did their worship on Tuesday night instead. What does the Bible got to say about this? There are two different places in the Bible that commands us to do specific things upon the first day of the week. First one's in Acts 20 and 7. We actually read it a while ago. It says, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples come together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Then in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given you... As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. 
Now there's a lot of different things that we can learn from these two passages of scriptures concerning the first day of the week. The first one is that the first day of the week is sacred to God for the communion service. We cannot take communion any other day of the week because God specified that particular day that he wants this done. And it was the, on the first day of the week that his son rose from the dead. That's why he holds it in such high esteem. And we cannot change this. We do not have the authority. The next thing we learn is that, is that we have the ability or the, or the liberty to preach upon the first day of the week because the Apostle Paul gave us an example that he did it then. Now, does this command limit us to preach into the first day of the week only? Absolutely not. The day was specified here for the breaking of bread, and an example is given that we can preach also on this day, but the preaching is not limited to this day because that was not the specified day for preaching. In fact, we're told to preach all the time. 2 Timothy 4 and 2 says, Preach the word. Be in season out of be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So here the Bible specifically tells us not only to preach the word on Sunday or in season, but also to preach the word out of season or any time we get the chance to. So we're told to preach all the time. <coughs> First Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 that we read a while ago, we find something else that we're commanded to do upon the first day of the week, and that is concerning the collection for the poor saints or the necessity of the saints upon the first day of the week. Everybody is supposed to give according as God has prospered so that when a necessity arises, that money doesn't have to be collected on the spur of a moment. It's already an account overseen by the elders. <clears throat> but in a couple of different congregations inside the church itself, there are a couple of young people that do some erroneous teaching have decided that they're not supposed to, that they're supposed to do things on Saturday like they did in the Old Testament instead of the first day of the week like the New Testament. They don't understand that in John the 20th chapter that God changed the time from the Old Testament of an evening and a morning being a day that it changed to the morning and evening being a day. And the pattern changed. There are entire religions built upon the idea of seventh-day worship instead of first-day worship like the New Testament commands us. When we're, when we're commanded to come together upon the first day of the week to observe the Lord's table, His body and His blood that was shed and given to us by the example of Christ Himself, by the law of exclusion, we cannot at any other day partake of that. Cannot. One of the things that I want to look at that the law of exclusion forbids is musical instruments in the worship of God. Now, under the Old Testament, there are actually certain ceremonies that musical instruments were commanded to be employed in, in rituals that they were doing. But in the New Testament, we can go through history and prove that man is the one that instituted them into the New Testament church. <clears throat> In the American Cyclopedia, volume 12, page 688, it says, Pope Vitalian is related to the first introduced organs into some of the churches of Western Europe about 670, but the earliest trustworthy account is that of one sent as a present to the Greek Emperor Constantine, Primus to Pepin, King of the Franks in 755. Now here's where many say, but the Bible, but where in the Bible does the law of exclusion forbid musical instruments? Well, Ephesians 5 and 19 says, Speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Do you notice where the melody was supposed to come from? From your heart. Not a guitar, not a drum, not some other type of musical instrument. But the melody is specified to come from our heart. That excludes all other places. Another separation that's plagued the church for many years 
is the idea of multiple cups in the communion. It's been over a hundred years now since it was introduced into the church. <clears throat> Although through history, we can understand that man started the idea of more than one vessel in the communion, and it was not God's idea. It was as early as the 3rd or 4th century, if memory serves right, that the first recorded use of cups being plural instead of cup being singular was used in any type of writing from the apostolic fathers or from the early church members. We can also find out through history that it was the year of 1894 when individual communion cups were patented and started in Protestant churches. And we know through writings that it was G.C. Brewer uh, being a Church of Christ preacher that first brought into the Church of Christ the individual communion cups. He actually makes a brag about it in a book he wrote called 40 Years on the Firing Line. I have that book with that part highlighted. Should anybody want to see it? I also have a paper <clears throat> from uh, the Gospel Advocate, which is the oldest Church of Christ publication still being written, that says in 1915 is when they advocated in the Churches of Christ the individual communion cup. My question is, if it was in the beginning, why did they have to start advocating it? Well, history tells us that it was not in the beginning that man added it. Let's see what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 11, chapter, starting with verse 23, the Apostle Paul gives his account of it. There's four different accounts of communion being instituted into the church in the scriptures. You have Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John does not have an account of it. Uh, and then you have the Apostle Paul's account here in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter. He says, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take ye, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the world, Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of the Lord. In every instance in the Bible, whenever the communion is given, all four of them, it always refers to the cup in a singular form. By the law of exclusion, the singular, the, the singular cup is given and all other forms are excluded or forbidden. And actually, this is made so manifest to us that you actually have to try to understand it incorrectly. Let's take a look at a couple of verses. 1 Corinthians 11 and 26 says, For as often as you drink this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Is the bread and the cup in this verse both in singular form? The answer is, of course, it is, yes. They're both in the singular form. Now, some here may say, but Paul, we take and we break or divide the bread. The word bread can be used interchangeably in the Greek for loaf. And we understand that when we go to Walmart, buy a loaf of bread, there's 25 slices in it, don't we? So when Christ took the bread by example and broke that bread, there was still only one loaf, wasn't it? In the 1920s, in the late 1920s and early 1930s, whenever the one cup brethren, as we were called, when there was a group within them that could not defend our practice through debate and felt like they were losing because they were challenged with, well, if you can divide the loaf, then you have necessity or inference from the other, can divide the cup, and they could not beat this logic. So they thought within themselves, and I actually have a copy in a, in a uh, debate at home where two of the men got together, J. 
J.S. Bedingfield begged them not to start this. And they said, we can, since we cannot divide the cup, we cannot divide the loaf either. And so they quit breaking the bread as Christ did and passing it. Now they break it as individuals and pass it around. <clears throat> Since the loaf and the cup are both used in the singular form, then any numerical value that applies to one must apply to the other. In 1 Corinthians 10, 17, it says, For we being many are one bread and one body, for we're all partakers of that one bread. If there's one bread, there must also be one cup. Another thing that most people don't understand is that by Jewish tradition, written in the Talmud, which is a Jewish book of their feasts, kind of broke out more than what they are in the Bible, and they actually changed them over the years, believe it or not, that there were four cups on the Passover table, and that the one that Jesus took was the third cup in their service, the cup of blessing. In 1 Corinthians 10 and 16, the Apostle Paul writes and says, The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? If God would have wanted more than one cup in this service that we give to Him, He certainly had the opportunity to do it right then, didn't He? He could have said, Hey, y'all, y'all grab them four cups right there because we've got four on the table. We're going to pray over them and we're going to divide them, pass all four of them around. But he didn't do that. He only picked one of them. By the law of exclusion, we cannot add any more than that. <clears throat> Let's talk about Sunday school for just a few minutes before we close here. And I know that Sunday school is something I've been harping on for the last few years, but I want to make sure that our children understand that Sunday school is not a scriptural deal. And it did not start until 1783. Even specified this man's name. His name's Robert Rakes, the guy that invented it. <clears throat> now the question may come up, where in the Bible does the law of exclusion forbid Sunday school? And it's actually answered in two different scriptures and in two different ways. So let's take a look at them. In Ephesians 6 and 4, it says, In your fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. The teaching and instruction of the Lord and the fear of the Lord is supposed to be given to the children by the Father. Now all commentators agree, and the Greek also agrees with the commentators, that the word used for father here can also be used as the word parent. And so it includes not only the father, but also the mother as a governed body of the household. By the very law of exclusion, the parent is responsible for teaching their children the word of God until they're mature. Now some may argue, but you take them to church and they listen to the preacher and he teaches them. And the answer to that is the, the parent is still in the same room with the child. So they're under the parent's responsibility and protection during that time. When you take a child away from its parent and put it in a room for someone else to teach, then they're outside the authority and protection of the parent, aren't they? That's when it becomes wrong because it's the parent's responsibility to protect their children in all things, especially what's being taught by the Word of God. 1 Corinthians 14, starting with verse 29, says, Let the prophet speak two or three, and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy or teach one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforter. Here the scriptures plainly teach us that on any Sunday morning that we have, that whenever I shut up and sit down, it's right for someone else to get up and preach also. Same Sunday. Nothing wrong with it. But it specifies the way we do it. We do it one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. When you break children up into classrooms, 
It's no longer one at a time, is it? It's no longer all one learning the same thing, is it? When we started this lesson, we started with the account in Genesis and the garden, how God explains the law of exclusion by excluding the tree of knowledge of good and evil and their ability to eat it. The Bible actually ends with the same concept. In Revelation, the 22nd chapter, verses 18 and 19, for it says, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. We have no right, no authority by any means to include or exclude anything from the Word of God. We are to simply take it for what it says and trust God in all things. I never want to close a talk without offering the invitation. Most of us here know it. You have to hear the Word, have faith, repent of your sins, confess Christ before man, be buried with him in the watery grave of baptism to have your sins washed away, to be resurrected for the first time, a new creature, one that's ready to obey God and listen to him. If we can help anybody in that manner, if anybody needs prayers to the church, please come forward as we stand and sing the song selected. I want to thank everybody for your attention this morning. That wound up being a little bit longer than I mean, so I'm sorry. I want to make it very clear that within the church itself, we're always going to have a little bit of there, There's things that we can disagree on that are absolutely in no way threatening to our eternal existence in heaven. But when we change the word of God, I think there's plenty of testimony in the Old Testament, man's in the New Testament. To tell us not to do that, that it can be very dangerous to our eternal existence. We don't have the authority to change. We do have the right to trust, which under the Old Testament we didn't have. We were without God, we had no hope. Now we're blessed because Jesus broke down the middle wall of petition that kept us away. We were what the Bible calls a far off, us Gentiles were. We didn't have a prayer. But because of God, we do. Because of the sacrifice of Jesus, we do. So let's use the gift that was granted to us, the grace that was given to us. Now let's follow Jesus and just do what he says and trust him. Make it as simple as not as complicated.